pleased to welcome you to this um, Public Policy Chamber event tonight, which is a panel discussion of ballot question 300. My name is Rick Sampson. I'm the immediate past chair of the chamber and will be acting as a moderator tonight. The chamber would like to thank Chuck Allen. Where did Chuck go? Is he still here? Chuck uh, is the executive vice president of the Longmont area of Guarantee Bank and made the facilities available to us tonight. We really appreciate that. One of the things we traditionally do as a chamber is we recognize elected officials. And uh, we have the chief elected official here tonight. He gets introduced in a few minutes. <laughs> but what I'd like to do is introduce the elected officials that we have here. Matt Jones, who is our current House representative. Will Tour is here. Um, Deb Gardner. Over here. And then we have Brian Bagley, City Councilman, City of Longmont. Bonnie Finley, City Councilwoman. The uh, alumni chamber has not taken a position on ballot issue 300. On all policy issues, what we do as a chamber is we like to provide our membership a venue to listen to both sides of an issue, and that is the case tonight. If there's a question about how come seating was limited, it's because this is a chamber event. There are more people here than we could get at the chamber, so it's still a chamber event. I, we just need to know that. The format for tonight's event is to provide a panel discussion to hear both sides of the fracking issue on question 300. The attendees are members of the chamber, as I've mentioned, and we've reached out to the governor's office with uh, Governor Hickenlooper, and uh, uh, I knew I was gonna do it, Will. Uh, Dr. William Fleckenstein, I've worked on Fleckenstein all day, <laughs> but I introduced himself, he said, think of this, and I said, I can't do that. Uh, I was fully screw it up, and I did. And then from our health, our future, our long mind, uh, we have, I think, four members here and then two panelists. Here's the process we're going to follow. Uh, I'm going to set a brief introduction, and then each panelist will have three to five minutes for a presentation regarding their respective positions on the issue. We're then going to move to a question and answer session. I have a list of pre-prepared questions that I have shared only one <coughs> with Dr. Fleckenstein, uh, and I will direct these to the panelists. It's not a debate. This is a sharing of information. The last 15 minutes will be reserved for questions from the audience. And on your chair, you have a 3 by 5 index card. And if you have a question, what I'd ask you to do is write the question out, send it down to the end of the aisle. Kathy and Scott, someone will pick them up. Uh, we'll look at them, they'll get them divided up with questions for uh, the governor, Dr. Fleckenstein, or Michael or Gene. And then I will alternate those questions so that we have a, uh, have a fair opportunity for everyone to, uh, to respond. Let me set the stage for this. As most of you know, the Longmont City Council adopted some comprehensive regulations regarding the development of oil and gas within the city limits. There were a group of citizens who uh, felt the council did not address the issue of fracking, and the council would not agree to add a fracking <coughs> in the regulations. The citizens group had a petition drive to place an initiated ordinance on the ballot in November that, if adopted, will amend the city charter by adding a prohibition against fracking of wells within the city. At about this same time, coincidentally, the Colorado Oil and Gas Commission, at the direction of the governor's office, took the unprecedented action of suing Longmont over the recently adopted regulations. But folks, the issues facing Longmont are not local issues. They're county, state, and national issues. In a meeting Monday morning with Kathy, uh, I get a text from a friend of mine, a chamber member, who says, hey, Rick, I just got this text from my sister in Oregon, and it had to do with Longmont and fracking, a, a publication in, in Oregon. Uh, read the paper over the weekend, the uh, drilling fields in California are being opened up, are being reactivated, are being enacted. And almost weekly there's a story from some eastern states on the issue of drilling. 
primarily regarding fracking. So once again, uh, we believe from the chamber standpoint, our issues are, are local issues, but they are, have national import. And at the moment, Longmont appears to be at the forefront of the discussion. Now for an introduction of our guests. We are honored and pleased to have with us tonight Governor John Hickenlooper. This bio is from the governor's office, so if you think sure, they, they know. <laughs> Pick a sentence and use one sentence. <laughs> a former geologist, brewer, small business owner, mayor of Denver, now our governor. Plenty. <laughs> Colorado School of Mines, we have Dr. William Fleckenstein, who is an adjunct professor with the Department of Petroleum Engineering at the School of Mines. Dr. Fleckenstein teaches graduate courses in drilling, completions, and workovers with special emphasis on shale and other unconventional reservoirs. He has 26 years of experience in multiple basins, worldwide, worldwide shale reservoirs in California to deep water, eastern Mediterranean, and is the director of PERFORM, which is dedicated to developing new fracking fracturing technologies. He is a co-author and recently won a National Science Foundation competition to study the drilling and completion risk to sustainable gas production from unconventional resources. If you go on the, on the internet, uh, he is a very prolific author. Representing our citizens group tonight, our health, our future, our long mind, is Michael Belmont, a business owner, husband, father, having raised two girls in long mind, a musician, fundraiser and volunteer for many nonprofits. Though born and bred and buttered in Texas, Michael has lived with his family in Longmont for 22 years. Michael is also a chamber member. Governor, he wrote that I did. <laughs> Steal it. <laughs> also representing our health, our future, and our Longmont tonight is Jane Ditzler. Uh, Jane is a co-owner of Redwall Communication, the creative design agency in Longmont. She owns the business with her husband, Dan, has two children, six and nine, she is originally from Ohio. She's lived in Longmont for 12 years. And through her business, she has been active in many business, community, and arts groups, as well as contributing to nonprofits. That's our panelists tonight, folks. I would now call on Governor Hickenlooper for opening remarks. And I'll be very brief, because I think your questions and having a real dialogue here is the, the best use of our time. I came out of Colorado first in the, in the 70s as a, a graduate student in geology. Uh, I got my master's and had a choice between Houston, Denver, um, and my wife who lived many years in love, Texas. She thinks it, but it didn't take me very long. I chose Colorado just for the quality of life and because almost, at least in those days, almost every geologist was an environmentalist. That's why I spent my two years doing field work north of Yellowstone Park in the, in the Beartooth Mountains, what we call the Hyde Saracas, uh, which were two of the greatest summers of my life. And have, even when I got laid off in 1986 and I was out of work for almost 30 months, ended up going from one fluid into another into the group business, uh, I kept up my membership as a, as a geologist all those years because it was kind of connected me to the land. And we did fracking back in 1981 when I first did drill the first well out here. Uh, this notion that you could go into different formations that had oil or, or gas and push in fluids under pressure. And those fluids would, you put enough pressure and they would break apart, open up fractures, and they would have what they call problems, little bits of sand or silt in them. And then when you took the pressure off and took that fluid back up the hole, the, the, the sand and the grit would stay there and prop open those, all those little fractures and enhance the, your ability to get oil and gas out of that well. And it was, you know, then it was fairly early, um, but it was still a, a, a remarkable ability to get energy out. Uh, over the years, you know, fracking has been used in tens of thousands of wells, not just in Colorado, but hundreds of thousands of wells around the country. And it's an industrial process. It's not completely without risk. But it is something that has, you know, I always try to look at these things as a, all those years as a small business guy. What is the risk you're taking and what is the reward? Um, and I, you know, we often talk about fracking, and that, you know, Colorado is the center of what we call this unconventional drilling techniques of, of doing horizontal drilling. Where they can they drill down a mile, and then they'll go after another mile horizontally and stay within a two foot wide shale seam, and 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 be able to keep the well exactly within there. 
And you know, these places, they have huge amounts of overburden. The, the, the pressure that you put on the frack, <coughs> certainly everywhere in Colorado, is in, in 99 and 44 one hundredths of the cases, the pressure isn't sufficient to break through that overburden. You've got to seal the reason all that gas and oil is trapped there is you have these incredibly strong seals that, that hold the oil and gas in over not just centuries and millennia, but over you know over hundreds of or, or many tens of millions of years. Uh, ultimately, you have to look at some of the benefit of what inexpensive natural gas is. This is not like fighting one field of natural gas or one field of oil. Uh, inexpensive, I mean, our, our price of, of, of natural gas is as low, if you inflation adjusted, it's, it's, it's equivalent to, uh, it's the lowest it's been in 35 years. And what it means is that we're able to use natural gas to, to offset the, the burning of coal for generation of electricity. We're having more vehicles use it uh, in, in place of gasoline or diesel fuel uh, in vehicles. Uh, you know, natural gas gives off 45% less CO2 per energy unit than, than does coal. The results of this, and no one talks about this, but this is a profound consequence to our environment. Right? We have CO2 levels, and the, the, what the United States is emitting as CO2 at the lowest levels in 20 years. I, mean, I don't want to get into this debate about climate change, and I know that I really want to rile people up to start talking about climate change. but. However you look at it, we all buy home, homeowners insurance, we should be looking at how do we mitigate whatever potential risk for the climate. And uh, you know, US carbon emissions have dropped per capita by over 20% uh, in the last few years. They're uh, down 14% just from their, the, the peak in, in 2007. So per capita, CO2 emissions are at the lowest level since 1961, right? Since John Kennedy took office. Uh, and I think that gets overseen uh, by the by the, this, this change, which I understand is very threatening. I think people in my position have uh, an obligation to mitigate the risk as much as humanly possible. And we've been working as hard as we can to say, how do we measure water wells all over so we can have baselines? Uh, we have now 90% of every well, oil and gas well that's drilled, we have a baseline uh, measurement for uh, water in that well and in the closest neighboring well. Public, we publicize that, that water information so we can keep track if there's a problem. Uh, we are worked out so that we now uh, have we worked out agreement between Halliburton and the Environmental Defense Fund so that what is in the frac fluids is transparent. So, uh, so the EDF signed off and the, the, uh, the drilling, the, what we call the service company industry is all agreed. And, and we, we do uh, well log testing of the Put a steel uh, steel pipe down the well and you cement it in with concrete. We now measure the integrity of that. We never used to do that, but we've for that. This is something we've been doing for I think like 12 or 14 years. And we will move towards the place where we, we still need to work as fugitive methane, the, the, the emissions that come off, natural gas we're not capturing. Uh, I think we're close to having uh, stronger improved regulations in them as well. But we should keep track of what inexpensive natural gas does for the air that we all breathe. Uh, what the, uh, the benefits are, long range to our planet, uh, these are significant. Dr. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this panel. One thing I want to make clear is that these opinions are mine, they're not those of the Colorado School of Mind. I witnessed the oil industry uh, have an epiphany of, uh, on safety, health, and the environment uh, protection since I began working offshore when I was going to the Colorado School Mines in the summer in the mid 1980s uh, as a roustabout and later as a roughneck on drilling rigs. Uh, and then later uh, as a drilling supervisor and an engineer uh, on over 200 wells uh, out in the state of California. Next was involved in really the first uh, modern horizontal well in California in, in 1990. There have been over a million. It's hard to over, hear in the back. There's been over a million hydraulic frack jobs that have been done in the United States uh, since uh, uh, since 1947. Uh, and in the U.S., uh, that, that's done long before the shale boom ever took off. Uh, now, if there was a problem with hydraulic fracturing, uh, 
uh, it would have really been identified by now. Uh, the regulations in those early days were nothing compared to what they are now. Nobody really looked at it. Frank Wells in California, and it was not a problem. Currently, there's nearly 1,200 rigs in the United States that are drilling horizontal wells, twice as many as are drilling vertical wells. And mainly, they're drilling uh, for these shale reservoirs. The U.S. has a tremendous amount of experience in drilling and the hydraulic fracturing of these horizontal wells. It's not a new, it's not an experimental technology. It's well proven and it's well known uh, within the industry. I was personally involved in fracture stimulating many wells in California, which I believe most people would agree is one of the most environmentally sensitive states in the country. And I'd also like to say that Colorado now leads the way as the model that many other uh, nations are following, let alone states, as far as how to effectively regulate shale development. Now, shale development, it combines horizontal drilling <coughs> and multi-stage hydraulic fracturing. Now, this is an made in American technology, and it's something we should really be proud of because it's directly resulted in the United States having the lowest natural gas prices in the industrialized world, and it will stay that way for many years because there are many, many locations that are known across the country where we can just go out and drill. The U.S. is just now beginning to get an understanding of how widespread these shale reservoirs actually are across the country. And that gives us the ability to say now with growing confidence that the United States and North America is going to truly achieve energy independence in the near future, not sometime down the road. I've traveled a lot in Europe talking about this issue. Uh, I've been involved, involved in, in shale development, hydraulic fracturing workshops uh, in Brussels, in Bucharest, in Sofia and Warsaw, and in 10 days I'm gonna leave to take a week's trip to have three conferences in Ukraine. Shale reservoirs are all over the world. It's not something that we have the corner on the geology here. They're everywhere. So the question is why are they not being developed? Because shale reservoirs occur anywhere you have conventional uh, oil and gas production because it's the source for that conventional hydrocarbons. And the answer is very simple. Shale development has not occurred in Europe because of the regulatory framework there. There has been bans on hydraulic fracking in places like France, where you have now these wonderful shale basins that have been discovered. People have drilled a lot of wells in the Paris Basin for conventional oil and gas, and they have shales that equal what we have in the United States in the Eagleford and the Bakken, but they are not being developed because of these hydraulic fracturing bans. Now, the refusal to allow shale development is directly responsible for Europe's high natural gas prices, which are approximately three times what we have in the United States. They also have a tremendous dependence upon Russia for natural gas. And they have a growing lack of economic competitiveness because if you have natural gas that's cheap, it means that you can afford to pay more for wages, pay more for taxes, Social Security, etc. Europeans have much higher prices, and they've got a problem. Thank you. Gene Dislayer. Hi. <laughs> For any of you that know me, you know that I am more than reluctant to speak on behalf of myself, let alone. 8,000 people who signed and supported a vote to prohibit fracking in Long City limits. Um, I also have here today, and, and I've been asked to deliver to the governor um, a statement from another 8,000 people from throughout Colorado who support Longmont in their prohibition. So here you go. Uh, about a year ago in Longmont, we began our education on the issue of fracking, and it has been nonstop ever since. There isn't a day that goes by that I don't hear or learn of something new, and I feel that I will never know the complete story, as it is always ongoing and changing. It started for us with the 
discovering that an operator was about to drill next to our middle school and one street over from my home. Then we learned an older well that was already at the middle school had been contaminated for years, during many of which that well wasn't even fenced. The well operator eventually voluntarily fenced it when they discovered children were playing on the equipment. There were other contaminations and violations of the other wells in the area. I met a man who lives at Union Reservoir who was about to have a well dr drilled 50 feet from his property line. And I met his toddler son with beautiful curly hair who was at that age where you have to chase them everywhere they go. We protect our children from so much and here he was facing and fighting for his child, his home, his safety. You can understand our fear and really our outrage at not only the entire process of fracking but at the organization meant to oversee and regulate it. Since then, I've learned more than any private citizen should need or want to really know about fracking, and many others in our group have too. <laughs> My knowledge is peppered with both the industry standpoint of technology best practices in the day, and the very human toll that fracking has taken on the citizens of Colorado and the United States. I know that the industry, the state, and the COGCC believe that if they could just educate us enough, we will understand how safe it is. Unfortunately, I've had quite the education. The problem with education is you can't control where a person empowered with knowledge will take it. I've learned enough about fracking to know that plans best laid, laid often go awry. There will always be human error, equipment failure, and accidents. The best regulations in the world will not ensure compliance. And scientists and engineers have a faith in their ability to control the natural world that sometimes does not gel with reality. Over this past year, I've seen grown men cry at the loss of their dreams, at the fear for their children, at their inability to control the circumstances that are destroying their lives. And I wonder about the others, the many who have been affected, but cannot speak because they have settled lawsuits. I know they are out there, you only have to Google fracking and lawsuits to see that there's an entire booming trade in suing the oil and gas industry for damages in Colorado. It's interesting that Governor, Governor Hickenlooper said about risk, now, in the end, it isn't really so much that we have different understanding of the issue. Both sides of this issue probably understand it to somewhat equal extent. We both have access to the same studies. We both have gaping holes in the information. We both know there are dangers and that there are efforts to mitigate and minimize those dangers. Where we differ on is risk tolerance. The COGCC, COGCC and the state and the industry say, we don't really have solutions to all of these problems, but we are going to forge ahead. The risks are certainly worth the financial gains. But those of us who are here waiting for the same answer say, we don't have solutions to these problems and the risks that you are willing to take are risks to our children, our homes, our safety, our health, and our city. Last but not least, Michael Belmont. Did I understand, Governor, that you were pulled from Texas to Colorado, kind of? Texas to Colorado. I did the same. I was pushed, though. I'm from Houston, the, the universe of uh, center of the universe for oil and gas. So I ran from there to get away from oil and gas, and look where I ended up. <laughs> Just kidding. I am not a politician or involved in politics. Not too interested to do so. I'm not. Don't consider myself an activist, and have never been involved in such a thing. But who is our health, our future, our long run? We are retirees, mothers, fathers, business people, doctors, nurses, neighbors, and friends and grandparents that simply care about the quality of life in our town and believe we have a constitutional right to health, safety, and protection of our property. <laughs> We cared enough about this issue to successfully gather over 8,000 signatures and place a charter amendment on the ballot that gives citizens of this fair town a voice in those rights by the opportunity to vote in November to prohibit hydraulic fracturing and its waste disposal from within the city limits. This amendment is entitled the Longmont Public Health, Safety, and Wellness Act for a reason. It is about initiating our time-honored constitutional right to protect our health and safety and our property against any threat 
whether posed by a uranium dump site, a sludge farm, or hydraulic fracturing, as in this case. Our Longmont would like to thank the governor for inviting us to be part of his meeting. However, we are a little puzzled about how it came to be. And with all due respect to the governor and with appreciation for his presence, please allow me to be frank with a few concerns. Here is our government, governor, a former oil and gas geologist, who says he wants to listen to the citizens of Longmont about their concerns surrounding this industrial activity close to our homes and schools. And yet he set this meeting at the last minute with little time for us to prepare. Limited attendance and a hand-picked audience that excludes most of the very people that he claims he wants to hear, the citizens of this town. Obviously, Governor, you have with you an expert with initials behind his name, presumably to make your case that hydraulic fracturing is safe, when in reality, our own, your own regulatory commission, the COPCC, and the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment have publicly stated that there are no studies confirming that this industrial activity is safe for humans when conducted next to our homes, schools, and reservoirs. Interestingly, studies that should have been done by our government, whose duty it is to protect its citizens, have instead been conducted by independent <coughs> experts and clearly indicate the negative human health impacts. I hereby present to you one of those studies that is peer-reviewed and authored by Dr. Theo Colburn, a Colorado endocrinologist. It is entitled Natural Gas Operations from a Public Health Perspective and it is, indicates the long-term, often devastating health effects over the life cycle of a natural gas well. Therefore, on behalf of our long run, there are really only two valid questions tonight, and they are fairly directed to you, Governor. Why, as the governmental head of this state, charged with the duty to protect the health and safety of we, your citizens, have you not initiated a single, independent, unbiased study assessing the human health impact of these dangerous industrial operations? And having not done so, why do you insist on imposing this dangerous industrial operation next to our homes, our schools, and our reservoirs, putting our children at risk? Unless and until these most critical questions are answered directly and completely. No other questions really matter. All we are asking governors is to keep Longmont a great place to live. You are in our Longmont for one hour. We and our families for a lifetime. The format is that I get to ask the questions. So Governor, if you feel like you need to respond to Michael's questions, feel free to, but that's not our format. Uh, it's not to direct questions to each other, it's not to debate, but it's to answer some questions that uh, uh, have been put together by the chamber. What I would ask you to do now, if there are questions that you would like to have addressed to the panelists, if you could write, I see some of you doing that already. Craig is going around to pick them up. If, uh, if during uh, the, the question period there are more, just kind of hold it up like Brian is doing, and we'll come by and pick it up. I uh, talked to Dr. Fleckenstein and said that I would like him to start this off. Uh, I think there are a lot of us that really uh, don't understand the term fracking, and this is his area of expertise, so Dr. Fleckenstein. Is a, is a very simple type of a, of, a, of a technology. It's a very simple technique. But basically, you're pumping fluid at a high pressure uh, down a tubular of some sort. Uh, it could be tubing, it could be casing. Uh, you're going to then pump it against a formation, and you're going to exceed the fracture pressure of that rock. Uh, and at that point, the rock will break. 
of the fracture is going to extend some distance into the reservoir and it also has the ability to extend upward and downward. It depends upon the physics of the earth that determines where it actually goes to. Now there's one thing we do know about shale reservoirs. Uh, there's been a lot of work with what is called micro seismic. And what micro seismic does is it actually physically measures the sound of the rock breaking. And we've been able to determine where those fractures actually go to. It's been a critical technology to determine uh, exactly where these fractures go to from the side point uh, moving up uh, in the earth, etc. And you've been able to look in the Barnett and in the Marcellus, all of the high points, the outliers of these frac points, uh, as far as where the fractures went to. And it's been shown that there's thousands of feet between where the fracture is actually extended up to and the deepest water wells that are in the vicinity literally thousands of feet. Now, what causes the frack not to move up to the surface? Well, for one thing, these are what they call water fracks. A water frack has mainly water in it. So when it comes across a permeable formation, the water leaks off, and you're not able to have a high enough of a pressure in order to physically extend the fracture anymore. So that's one of the safe things. The other thing is that the frack is going to move, and it moves in relation to stress. Okay. So you can just imagine you've got all this overburden that's on top of the earth, anywhere in the point. And that rock is going to have different types of characteristics, shales, sandstones, etc. And as you're pushing downward with this overburden stress, some of the stress moves horizontally, and it moves horizontally in relation to those uh, mechanical properties. And eventually, the frack comes up to a point where it doesn't have enough stress to physically split the rock, and it stops. And, and that's one of the biggest protections that you have from the fractures actually moving up and getting anywhere near the aquifers, which is what the case has been. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, a question for uh, our city, our Longmont. Would one of you or both of you like to address the issue of why you felt it was necessary to do a petition drive to get this on the ballot to amend the city charter? Why is it necessary to do a petition drive to get it on the The issue of fracking on the ballot, yes. important to understand that when framed fracking sounds very safe and indeed there are great there has been great progress and there are strides being made all the time and that's wonderful and of course we endorse that uh, and I'm setting the stage here because why do we even get, we're concerned about fracking um, first of all fracking is uncon the, the modern fracking is not what it was years ago. It's only been around about 10 years in popular or common use. And that's because it's there's a reason for it's called unconventional. It's multi-path, multi-well path. In the old style, up until about 10 or 15 years ago, there was this one well per site. It can be up to 52 wells per site. There's a, a, a tremendous concentration of exposure at this time. So that's one aspect of the unconventional newer style drilling that concerns us and why we felt necessary to address it. Slick water is another term that is newer, involving newer and different chemicals, more chemicals, many of which are known to be carcinogenic. High volume, whereas it was maybe half a million gallons per frac, maybe it's, it's two to five million gallons per frac, and each well can be fracked usually three times multiply by a six well pad, which is not uncommon. High pressure, high volume, we discussed that. Directional drilling also is fairly recent in terms of being able to do that efficiently and effectively economically. So why are, were we concerned? This why, newer, why is it on the ballot? I'm sorry, why is it on the ballot? We, because we believe that this is a dangerous industrial operation. And to not only allow that operation, 
but it is imposed upon us by the current regulations, and, and I want to talk about that later perhaps, the regulations, but um, it is imposed upon us next to our schools and homes, and because of this newer, more lethal <coughs> concentration of many wells per pad, it is untested in terms of impact on human health, relatively untested, and the only tests that have been done it typically are, show, are showing negative health impact, and thus it is better to be farther than, than closer to a well. Thus, we believe to protect the quality of our town, to keep Longmont a great place to live, and, and the health and safety of our citizens, and indeed property values that do fall as a result of this industrial, it's having an, an industrial operation next to your home that can't help the value of your home. We believe that the citizens deserve and have a constitutional, constitutionally protected right in Colorado for the, their safety, their health, and their property values. And the choice to in that matter. I'm sorry, in the one line. And a choice to have a choice in that local control of what affects our health, safety, and property values. Thank you. I've been asked to explain that, uh, and I should have done this, I apologize for not doing it. The format that we're following is a standard chamber format. This has not been set up by anyone. We love it when the government, the governor can come to town and he was available tonight and it's set up for tonight. And if it was tomorrow night, we'd do it tomorrow night. So we're, we're kind of beholding to his schedule. This is a typical format. It is a chamber event and it is not set up for any other purpose other than to get information to our chamber membership on this issue of ballot issue 300. I asked uh, Jean if she wanted to speak on this issue. And... Okay, <laughs> right. uh, Governor, do you share the citizens' concerns about the effects of fracking on the public? I obviously have a different um, perspective, but I certainly share the, uh, well, I certainly recognize the importance of people's neighborhoods and their health uh, when they're making decisions. I grew up originally on the East Coast uh, and you know saw what the lack of regulation led to to people's uh, quality of life in the neighborhoods. Uh, you know, I look at a lot of what we're trying to do to make sure that we mitigate uh, risks. Again, the, the fact that we've drilled a million wells using fracking, right? Again, any industrial process is gonna have some risk involved, but this risk is, is, is remarkably low. I just looked at Theo Colburn's uh, paper here, which the conclusions were, and this was published in 2010, uh, so it was probably written in 2008. The end was to protect public health. We recommend full disclosure of all accounts, contents of all products, extensive air and water monitoring, coordinated environmental uh, human health studies. That's all happened. That's it's either happened or is in process. The uh, the, the disclosure of, of of what is in a, a frac. I mean, we sat down with the environmental scientists of the Environmental Defense Fund and the, and the scientists of the industry went back and forth on the, the, the difficulty of protecting trade secrets. And one of the issues was that, that Halberton has a, a frac fluid that is made up completely of food additives that you can drink. And their CEO is on repeat occasions, drunk in, in front of the public. Uh, their point is that they have to disclose in the exact proportion what the what the components of that are, they're they're I mean they spent tens of millions of dollars developing it. They would have to they would not use it in any state where it was where they required to give away their formula. Uh, same as if a state required Coca Cola to give the exact portions of their formula. But we did feel that they should should uh, reveal to the public what the what the actual different uh, compounds were, uh, and that was why uh, the environmental defense fund was willing to to stand up there. Uh, 
nobody, I mean, in Colorado, if you were to design a system, you wouldn't want to have a the split estate system we have. I don't think anybody, I'm not sure how it came to be, but the, this notion where you've got people that own the rights of, of, of minerals underground like oil and gas and yet you have people on the surface that don't have any benefit or any ownership in that. Uh, in most or many other states, that risk, the people drilling it are accepting that risk. Uh, and again, nobody wants to have that risk be anything more than what or they hire that it absolutely has to be. Uh, it creates a, uh, a difficulty in terms of establishing what is someone's uh, property right, uh, and, and how do you, if you're going to say, well, we don't want you to own that anymore, we're going to take that away from you, how do we compensate that? Those are not uh, simple questions. Uh, we look at, at fracking, and again, rarely have we seen the pro in the actual process of putting those clues. Now, there have been leaks, there have been mountains built, you know, our job, and, and, and we should be held accountable is that every time there is a leak, if we can find any of those chemicals in, in groundwater, um, we should be raising the fines to a point where that doesn't happen. But some of the worst environmental issues, we've got an underground leak from a refinery in northern, in northern in the north part of, of Metro Denver that we're spending millions of dollars, the, the company is, and, and trying to, to stop. We've never seen that kind and anything close to that in terms of uh, a leak from a pond or, or something like that. And that's, I mean, I'm not sure how many of you don't drive automobiles here, but we have to refine, if we're gonna drive vehicles, one has to refine uh, uh, crude oil, and that creates the risks we're now dealing with, right? And it's not elegant, it's not uh, certainly nothing that I think was intended, but it's part of it. Fracking allows us to to establish inexpensive natural gas, which, again, not only creates uh, jobs in Colorado, it not only uh, is, is less expensive. I mean, if you run it in your car, it's about a buck and a half, maybe even two dollars right now, less expensive than, than refined crude oil and gasoline. It's significantly cleaner. But also, we don't spend billions of dollars every year to foreign countries, right? And that's, um, an issue in, in, in as I, I mean I I go to the funerals when kids come back from uh, from our overseas engagements and and it's tough and there has to be some if you look at, at, at the benefits to the cleaner air and what that can do to the entire not just the entire state but the entire country um, and trying to make the world a safer place these allow some recognition that, there's, that we're trying to balance how can we do this as safely as humanly possible yeah, in, in all parts of the state. And, you know, I have my neighbor who was sitting there saying, well, what would you do if they were going to put uh, a, a drill a well and do a frack right, you know, where you live? How, how close is it too close? I said, well, I wouldn't like it. But he said, but no, no, if there was oil there, what would, you, what would your response be? I said, well, you know, I'd want a sufficient setback I'd want to make sure that the uh, that there was a, a fair, you know, uh, uh, environment by, by which they were going to uh, operate their well, that they were a reputable operator. Um, but in the end, I'd do it. I'd, I'd accept it. And when he ever looked at me and he said, well, you know, I'm not sure I would. I mean, that's what we're trying to work after to figure out exactly, given the what a cleaner, less expensive energy source that makes the world safer. What is that, how do we, how do we find the ways to mitigate it so that we can use it uh, safely? Uh -oh. You've got the next question. <coughs> Governor, why shouldn't a local government have the right to adopt rules to protect the health and safety of its citizens? The way we've always done it in the state is that the issue uh, such as long gas exploration where you have thousands of wells done um, uh, every year. If, if each municipality designed their own rules, uh, the, the ability of industry to 
uh, navigate those rules would be, almost, would be prohibited, almost impossible. And the, the sense has always been, and you know, there are strong voices in the legislature that, that the, the, the state has to be preeminent and has to listen. That's why I came up here, and I, you know, I didn't decide was unaware if I did, but I, I didn't set up this meeting. I understood there was a meeting here, and that they were, that the chamber wanted us to come up and to at least listen to questions and answer questions as best we can. Um, and that's, you know, at least that's how that, that's how the, this meeting came to me. Uh, we have a very highly flexible um, set of rules in the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission that allows a great deal of flexibility for local communities to have a, a, a local voice. And I, my understanding was that uh, a lot of what was negotiated uh, here uh, gave different contexts and allowed uh, uh, different outcomes uh, that protected people's neighborhoods. The, as a matter of fact, I think that negotiation ended up being a lot of what was put into uh, statute. But if, I mean, I don't know how many, what do we have, 250 or 300 municipalities in the state of Colorado, every one of them promulgated their own set of regulations. And trust me, if one community does it, then they'll all do it. And as a governor, there is absolutely nothing, I mean, there is no single thing I've done in my eight years since I went into public service and uh, it's an okay that we're going to have a, get into a legal tanks, uh, a device issue with one of our communities. I, that's the worst nightmare, nightmare for, for any governor in any state. But if we don't have some sort of consistent regulation, and again, have enough flexibility so people in the local communities can really deal with the variations of, of, of rulemaking and how it might affect their communities, then we're just going to have chaos. And, and this is something, you know, natural gas is something that has the potential to change this world for the better. I mean, significantly cleaner, safer, allows people Inexpensive clean energy allows people to move out of property. Yet. We'll eventually we'll get to wind, we'll get to solar. I mean, I, but that ain't going to happen the next two or three years. Right? If you're concerned about the environment you live in, uh, inexpensive natural gas is one of the most powerful, profound changes that can happen in short term. Right? In that 10 or 20 years, it's going to take us to get to true renewables. For the our city, our Longmont. Why isn't your group satisfied that the state of Colorado, through the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, is protecting the citizens of Longmont from the environmental hazards of fracking? I'm glad to leave the question up here. to have enough inspectors to inspect them. 
So no, I don't trust the COGCC. And if you ask the COGCC, I don't think they feel that they're doing a good job. I don't think they feel they're doing an adequate job. I mean, I had a friend that wanted to call them one day with a problem with his well. And the woman said, we're understaffed, so I don't know if we're going to be able to get back to you today. That's the answer you get when you smell something funny coming from your well? We're understaffed? So no, we don't trust the COGCC. And we don't think that, that, you know, that they are adequately equipped to protect our interests. Can I just add a time to that? I'd like to ask you a question. If you hired me to babysit your children. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you get, I would I hope. <laughs> uh, would you be comfortable if I said you don't mind if I only spend the first hour and then the next two I need to do my stuff and your kids so in other words one out of every three hours I'll, I'll be watching your kids but the rest they're on their own would you be comfortable with that that's exactly what Gene described currently the number by the way I asked those questions of Tom Kerr the, the past chairman of the COGCC, and he confirmed all of these questions. How many inspectors do you have? 18. How many wells? 49,000 was the number. I did a calculator. That's about an inspection every three years, whereas your regs require once a year. The wells, uh, are we comfortable with that? No. The wells are expanding exponentially. So number one, we need to triple our inspectors just to be up to speed so they can go visually inspect them once a year. Number two, as they increase, say 10% a year, we need to add, so you need to add 10% inspectors just to keep up. You, you said, speaking of regulations, you mentioned the difficulty of permitting in different communities. I don't think there's another industry governor, period, that doesn't deal with localities and all of their different regs and requirements and permitting process. It seems to work out fine in the rest of the world. Also, if you really want uniformity, let's go national. It, it's much more efficient if we have a national basis for uniformity. Maybe the EPA, oh, but we cry foul. When, when the real uniformity is brought up in, in, on a national basis, no, but the states need to have control. Oh, so now you know how we feel. So. That's how we feel about the regs. One more thing about the regs. <coughs> COGCC. I mean, the COGCC. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I lost my train of thought here. Is that I did ask Tom Kerr, oh, oh, this is what I needed to say. I asked him a series of questions at one of the setback meetings recently. One of which is, when, when were these regulations made? The setbacks in particular, which are a huge part, just as the governor referred, he's concerned probably mostly about the distance of that well to his house. We're concerned too, probably most about that. The regulations for the, the setbacks, 150 feet rural, 350 feet football field in, in town. Anywhere in town, as long as it's a football field. They, those were made approximately 1995, before unconventional drilling, drilling proliferated, before multi-well pads. Further, they were never, in the words of Tom Kerr, I can quote, I can read his quote if you wish, never, ever, health was considered in even the old setback rules when they were originally established in 95. So if they weren't established, if there was no health considered then, and we've quadrupled, we, we, greatly multiply the risk and the exposure by the density of the wells on any one pad, a football field away from the home. Don't you think they would require examination, maybe a lot more distance, because they were never vetted for health, only for explosion to get a fire truck around that thing and if the grid collapsed. So those are certainly our concerns. If you have good regulation, the best regulations in the world are moot ineffective if you cannot enforce them. Once every three years, at best, that's the number. I'm a, by the way, I only charge 10 bucks an hour. <laughs> I don't even know if that's a good price in <laughs> Well, remember, it's one in three.
Doctor, there's a follow-up question to all this. In your opinion, how do oil and gas companies protect residents from the fracking, fracking process that you've described and has been discussed? that are used in order to protect uh, humans, society, the aquifers, etc. The well construction process is based upon multiple defenses. And so for a fracking, it's going to occur in your fracking down casing. So the first line of defense is the steel casing itself you're fracking down. Now, you're monitoring the pressure on the back of the steel casing and in the casing. So if you start developing a leak, you're able to see that leak and the individual that's actually doing the monitoring, and there's several that are doing it, an operator's representative, usually also representative of the service company, they're able to shut down immediately. Okay, you also have uh, this surface casing. You drill down through the aquifers, the deepest known aquifer, and then you cement it back to the surface. And if the cement job is not good, you have to go back and re-cement it. And why do you have to re-cement it? Because structurally the well will fail if you do not have a good cement job on that surface case. And my job as a drilling supervisor was to stand there and make sure that that was filled up. Because if it was not, and you would put a million pounds worth of the next casing strings on it, it's going to buckle and fail. Okay, so you are able to protect very well that surface water from multiple things. Now, what's the best defense that you have from your neighbors having a problem. And I'll tell you what it is. It's people like me, the guys that are actually out there working in the oil field. We're the people that are going to make sure that those wells are operated correctly. We're the ones that are going to go out and make sure that they're operated up to what the regulations are, regardless of what the regulators come up. And we're going to even do a better job than what the regulators say because we want to protect our neighbors because we work in that community, we live in that community too. We're not evil people who work in the oil industry. Most of them are your neighbors. When you ask about what is the best defense that you're going to have, it's going to be the neighbors that are actually out there working on those wells. Because those are those kids too that are out there. Now one thing also I wanted to point out is there's a lot of misinformation about this entire issue. For one thing, the fluids that are used have very little chemicals in them as opposed to what used to be done these heavy cross-link types of systems. And the ones that hated this the most were the service companies, the Halliburton's, the BJ Services, etc., because they make money selling chemicals. And when you're taking chemicals out of that fracturing fluid, you're affecting their bottom line. Now, they never dream that they're going to be pumping so much because water fracks were so successful. And water fracks are the oldest types of fracks that were done before anybody figured out how to make cross-link fluids go in there. So basically we're returning back to the old methodologies, the tried and true simple technologies. There's only maybe one uh, half a percent or even let down to like a tenth of a percent of that frac fluid is chemicals. The rest of it is water. And the chemicals that are in there are things that exist elsewhere in, in, in the things we do like clean our swimming pools. Uh, that's going to be one of the chemicals as far as the acids is petroleum distillates, uh, if you go down the road and you see where people have leaking cars, that's probably putting more in the environment than you're ever seeing from those frac fluids that may be dripping. Because we make sure there's drip pans on location to make sure that you don't have any drips from the engines uh, in order to make sure you protect the environment in that manner. So there's a lot of things that you're able to do in order to protect things. And at the end of the day, the biggest defense is that people like me they're going to make sure that we do it correctly. Right. I don't know if you're following the methodology, but I'm trying to go in segments of questions. Uh, what is fracking, the concerns, the rules. Now we get into things that are a little more, I think, specific to Longmont from a chamber standpoint. Governor, according to news articles, uh, your office authorized the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission to sue the city of Longmont over its newly adopted oil and gas rates. If question 300 is adopted by the citizens of Longmont in November, will you authorize another lawsuit to invalidate 
the initiated charter. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, but, but I expect it probably would. I mean, I, you look at, uh, again, I'm not aware, maybe there are some other states that let each, each community uh, draft their own regulations around these uh, kind of endeavors, but I'm not aware of it. Uh, and I, again, I, I am open to sitting down and trying to negotiate um, and getting more inspectors. In, in the last few years, it's been hard to add any any state like right to cut. We've got, if you look at inflation adjustment, we've got a billion dollars less than we had five years ago, and <coughs> we have been understaffed in mean, almost everything. I mean, you look at how often do we inspect pharmacies? Uh, how often do we inspect, you know, the, the swimming pool, the chemicals used in the swimming pool? Uh, I remain hopeful that we can, you know, resolve this and settle it out of, out of court and have a, uh, Regular sort of regulatory system that where um, you know, long mud feels that their citizens are protected and that they have an opportunity if they're to uh, protect the, the quality of their neighborhoods and yet still make sure that uh, people that have you know, uh, you know, underground rights and things that have their fair share as well. Somewhere in there, there's there's a resolution, but I don't see. And again, I'm not a lawyer. I've never, you know, I had 16 or 17 restaurants and over 200 investors in all the different projects we did. And I've never been in court. I've never sued anybody. I've never been sued. Uh, we've always been able to talk through it. We tried. I thought at least the, the information came back to me as far as we could. Uh, but I never, I never quit. I never give up saying that we there got to be some way we can this out because there is nothing worse than being the governor in a legal battle with one of the municipalities. It's just the, the last thing you ever want to have. But I don't see any alternative. If you, go, if you let it go down, then every community is going to want to have their own regulations and you're going to have a hodgepodge and a, and a chaos. Notice Eugene is Eugene isn't here tonight, is he? Eugene Mize, the city attorney, I'm sure someone will communicate to him that you'd love to We're sit open down. To talk. <laughs> We're all open to talk to this issue. Let me ask the citizens group. When you uh, proposed uh, ballot issue 300, were you aware that it could possibly chase, uh, possibly have <coughs> from the state uh, if it was if your ballot initiative was successful? It's almost a yes or no question, Michael. <laughs> yes, yes, we're yes. aware. Okay. Obviously, I mean, the city's being sued for their regulations. We're, of course, aware. All right, would you like me to elaborate? Absolutely. I'd love you to do whatever you need. No, please, do elaborate. Do whatever you need. Yeah. Um, as long as you don't ask the governor a question. <laughs> Most of us have children here. What price do you put on your child's head as far as health? And in, in terms of exposure of things, we can have a choice in. Let me explain something about, in other words, of course we contemplated the possibility of a lawsuit. Could, can we afford, however, not to do this? Let me explain, first of all, a little bit about the Charter Amendment, since you may not have read it. Number one, it's been said that this has been challenged before. It's all been done, really, for instance, in the 90s. Ours is a very different approach. Ours takes a constitutional approach to health, safety, the Colorado Constitution. Secondly, unlike Greeley, we're not banning, and we don't seek to. We, we certainly don't think people are evil, and we love great, good jobs and local jobs, sustainable jobs, that keep our community desirable to attract more jobs mm -hmm. and pristine as it has been for so many years for a century and a half. But when, so our amendment does not prohibit drilling 
or access to those minerals. It simply and only prohibits hydraulic fractures. It's only one means of getting minerals. It's only one means of fra fracturing. Correct? No, I brought it. They're all I said no. Oh, okay. I, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. I, I'm not used to this. I'm not allowed. My I mentioned it three times. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> get, it'll take a couple more, I'm sure. <laughs> and so we have a, a brand new basis. And um, I, let me also tell you why I say the things that I do in terms of my concern about health. You've heard from, from Mr. <laughs> I just wanted you to feel better. I know. Uh, you've heard from them that fracking. Let's pretend for a moment. Or let's acquiesce that frack. First of all, is fracking 100% safe? Is it all? Is it certainly? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. A rhetoric question. Question is. Nothing is 100% safe, and the more you do something, the more likely there will be an accident, negligence oversight. So as it proliferates, there's more chance of that. But more importantly, comparing, calling fracking or, or considering fracking the only part of this discussion is like saying operating a vehicle is 100% safe. Or like most of the time safe. The, the issue and, is, yes, I'm, I'm getting the issue it. is the legal challenge based on your initiated order. Exactly. That's like saying the, an automobile Starting the automobile, it, that's like saying operating an automobile is starting the automobile. Fracking is only a very small part, and I'm getting to the challenge part, it's important if you help this framework, <laughs> is that there are many phases in the life cycle of a well. Transport, for one, one frack job, any, if you look at any statistics, over a thousand truck trips, diesel truck trips, you got six wells per pad, that's six thousand truck trips times three frack, three times 18,000 for one well pad going past your house. That's diesel fuel. You have diesel uh, in pumps going 24-7 during the fracking time. After this, I didn't even include the drilling, the drilling mods, etc. That's separate from the fracking. This goes to the lawsuit? Yes, it does. It could potentially be fine. Uh, <laughs> yes. So we, um, and after, what I'm, what I'm telling you here is that our concern about the possibility of, uh, let me give you an example, of being sued over this charter amendment, one mile, and I called the city on this, one mile of road rehab, just take the truck trips I just described to you, costs $300,000 plus or minus, one mile. You know we're going to have that. That's just one of the many aspects of potential impacts on this community that will cost this community. Wouldn't it be better to take that $300,000 and protect the quality of life that we have enjoyed for 150 years when there is no, there is no proof that this is a healthy, safe <coughs> operation next to schools and homes in the life cycle of the well. Remember, after the completion of the well, there is outgassing for 20 to 30 years. Each condensate tank outgasses at least two tons of hydrocarbons a year, along with many other fugitive gases that have been known to be carcinogens in it. We're not just talking about fracking here, folks, although that's what we're prohibiting in order to protect this city. Can I, can I help summarize and state that you agreed with Gene that yes, you consider the fact that the city should be sued for this Yes, and, and, uh, and similarly, I, can I? Uh, no. <laughs> this this will be the last prepared question, then we'll go into questions from the audience. And this is uh, for Dr. Fleckenstein. Uh, earlier in the evening, I shared with him the ballot uh, question 300 language, and I will leave that up here. My question for the doctor is: There are two prohibitions in the in the initiated ordinance. One is banning fracking and the other is prohibiting within the city of Longmont the storage in open pits or disposal of solid or liquid waste created in connection with the hydraulic fracturing process, including but not limited to flowbacks for produced wastewater and brine. And my question for the doctor is,
as a petroleum engineer, do you support the second part of that uh, initiator ordinance regarding the open pits and storage? The question, as I understand it, is: Do I really support the, you know, the, the prohibition of the storage pits or, or disposal? And so, when you talk about the storage the pits, uh, for one thing, as I look at this, it's difficult to understand what type of pits you're meaning. Uh, you know, are you talking about earthen pits? Uh, uh, does it also, uh, you know, possibly mean tanks that you have at the surface? But so, what exactly are you are you really prohibiting? Uh, but uh, if you're going to uh, have hydraulic fracture, you're going to have flowback of some sort. Now, there's an issue about the truck traffic versus some other ways of moving fluid. Trucks are very expensive, but they also have a tendency to cause accidents. When somebody's driving, it might be raining outside, it might snow. Uh, and so one of the things the industry is trying to do is to start using more pipelines to move fluid around. There's a lot less leakage from pipelines. Uh, you have a lot less worry as far as uh, uh, accidentally putting uh, something in the environment when a truck goes ahead and actually tips over. And, and so as the industry is getting better at the process, one of the things you're looking at is moving away from all these truck traffics to just having a simple pump to go ahead and move fluids with a, with a pipeline. But, you know, when you start, uh, uh, I think, handcuffing people and saying, well, you can't use open pits to store any type of, uh, uh, of disposal or solids, uh, and you say, well, it's in connection with the hydraulic fracturing process, that becomes a tremendously wide thing to look at. And one might argue and say, well, that could be the drilling process also, because that's what leads to the hydraulic fracturing process. I mean, there's many ways you can go ahead and read this as a petroleum engineer. Thank you, doctor. We're now going into the questions from the audience, and the way uh, they've been divided up is, is uh, those who would be in favor of 300 and those who would be opposed, those who are in favor, obviously, to my left, those who are opposed to my right. So the first question I have is for the governor. The governor of the state of Colorado receives revenue from oil and gas service taxes. This would seem an appropriate source to finance necessary and unbiased studies that the oil and gas industry does influence so that they can determine the outcome. So I guess the question is, Governor, could could the severance taxes that the state collects be used to fund these studies and uh, concerns that have been expressed tonight? And, and absolutely, I think that's a perfectly appropriate use. Severance taxes are used for a variety of uh, for road rehabilitation, for um, all kinds of um, making sure that those counties that have have negative impacts uh, from oil and gas. I'm thinking places not, I mean, where they have intensive use, uh, and you do see the uh, road deterioration. deterioration. Um, CSU is doing a study now, I'm trying to figure out where I had the piece on it now. Uh, it's looking at the, uh, the air quality around one of these intensive developments to That study and it should be right around here somewhere. Um, on a study in Garfield County. <laughs> um, it's going to provide air quality monitoring data from a number of well patrick drilling fracking flowback activities and monitoring operations uh, at various distances from the wellheads during all seasons. Um, and will obviously play a part in adjusting. complementing other analyses. That's one of the, the big challenges of all this is to continue uh, as much as the industry has improved over the last years, we should sell it up unless it continues to improve, right? And to, to continue to try and find, if if I'm right, and that the, nat the inexpensive natural gas allows us to have cleaner air, and, and I don't know how many of you people know someone with emphysema, you know, cycles in the weather here suffers terribly. Uh, if it allows us to get to cleaner air, if it allows us to 
uh, get more jobs back in this country by having uh, a lower cost for advanced manufacturing does in truth make the world a safer place. I think these are all pretty strong arguments for them. Then, then we need to hold industry to the high standards and make sure that they are trying to keep it uh, clean. We generally don't live in, in, a, I mean, in, in a clean world as we'd like it, right? It, American automobiles, if you, I don't know about your garage, but look under where you park your car, and maybe I need newer cars, but there's usually a stain <laughs> of oil that's leaked out of the, of either a seal uh, somewhere in the, in the vehicle, and that stain at one time almost certainly had toluene and benzene and a lot of the, the, the contaminants that, that we're talking about that, that, that come out, they're all basic components of hydrocarbons. Uh, I'm not justifying that. I'm just saying that's 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 what it is. We're not in a, in a in a pure system here. And what I look at this is is at, at a situation where it's scalable, where we're, we have the possibility to uh, have an overall cleaner environment. And in, in that process, we need to hold to hold the industry to again ever higher standards and figure out how do we reduce fugitive emissions and get to the point where we help them to uh, harvest that energy and not waste it. How do we make sure that we have uh, a full confidence in well more integrity uh, long term? How are we able to, to make sure that, that, that whatever spills occur, should a spill occur, that it's cleaned up properly, right? We want it perfect. If there is, someone does, if they're, if they're uh, moving a, a storage, a pipe from a storage facility to others, uh, uh, fluid with some hydrocarbons and it spills on the road, you should clean it up just like they do in any in any uh, industrial process, factory, maybe a steel mill, wherever. Uh, and again, that's what that's our, our ultimate goal. <coughs> so, Governor, if I understood you correctly, that is something that could be considered at the same level of the use of better science to fund these studies. Yeah. The question for Michael. Michael, this has to do with uh, you spoke about protecting property rights and property values. Did your committee give any uh, thought to how this might affect the property rights of people who own minerals that need to be developed that are under the city of Long? Property rights are very important and must be respected in all cases as long as there's no harm. Let me put it this way. I'm going to quote from a Supreme Court case in the last century. Neither property rights nor contract rights are absolute, for government cannot exist if the citizen may at will use his property to the detriment of his fellows. Now we've been talking a lot about health issues here tonight, unproven as they are, in terms of this industrial activity next to schools and homes. There's another more colloquial saying that says, your right to swing your arm ends where my nose began. And so yes, we honor and we want to honor property rights in all circumstances, as long as there's no harm that comes from that. I, I just want to quick say too, because when I'm talking about property rights, we're, we're talking about a breach of health, safety, and property values. We can talk about that all night, but, but because that's integral to that question, we've heard a lot about uh, safer and cheaper and so on. But I want to tell you that the emissions from these things that are ongoing over 20 and 30 years, you have to look at the life cycle of a, hydro, uh, of a fuel source. Yes, natural gas is the clean, one of the cleanest burning, and that's wonderful. However, it's also one of the dirtiest on, in, one, in the extraction process, but also 
it creates in the burning of methane far more ozone than even the, the hydrocarbons that are north normally emitted. And I want to say that it is a scientific fact that ozone creation at the ground level was never meant to be at the ground level, it's supposed to be way up there, it has been proven to cause serious health and even fatal health results. At, at least 5,000 people are known to, to die from ozone. These natural gas emissions create ozone. That's a whole different issue when you're talking about dirty and clean, and it's a health issue. I want to keep coming back to the, to the property rights. When they breach the health of an individual, then those rights have extended beyond what they should be allowed. One last question. One last question. Uh, this governor for, for you or for the doctor. Uh, are there or can there be objective studies about the effects of fracking that might lead to a reasonable resolution of this matter? Yes, actually, I believe you can say that. Uh, and, and we're in the process of right now. The award hasn't been made, so I've been told not to talk too much about it. But uh, the Colorado School of Mines, in partnership with the University of Colorado's Environmental Department, uh, is uh, you know has uh, appears to get a grant, a very large grant, for studying a lot of these issues. Uh, this is a very important issue nationwide. Uh, there are probably 230 uh, I think, uh, uh, proposals that were made. So can go ahead and study this in, a, in an unbiased manner. It, one of the best ways to do it is to get two groups that have opposing viewpoints and, and, and allow them to look at the same data and be in the same room and, 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 and then be able to come up with what you think is going to be an unbiased uh, type of, uh, uh, of, a, of a study. Because at the end of the day, the science speaks for itself. Uh, you can't argue that every time you drop an apple, it's going to hit the ground can't argue with that unless you're in a place where there's no gravity or there's some other odd thing that's been done. But when you look at what Mr. Isaac Newton discovered how many years ago, the element started elemental physics. How do you describe how that apple drops? Science is going to be based on facts and that's the key thing that has to be in this study and has to be in this debate is facts. A lot of misinformation is floating around right now. Unfortunately, there has to be more facts for people to look at. And scientists and engineers are able to go ahead and do that as long as you're able to do it in an ethical manner. We're at 8 o'clock. That's the end of the program. Can we give the panelists a hand, please?